All right, hello everyone and happy Wednesday. Um, I am your host and organizer, Amy Rawls, Clinical Services Manager at Transformation Enzyme Corporation. Before we get started today, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Um, this is a live event today, but parts of it will be recorded for viewing for those of you who are unable to join us at this time. Again, this is an interactive event, so please live chat your questions as you're watching using the questions box in the audience panel. Our team will do our best to respond to your questions via chat or at the conclusion of the live presentation. So, about our topic today. When the daylight hours lengthen and the school lets out for the summer, it's easy to take a relaxed attitude towards kids' sleep habits. But despite the fact that few children want to go to bed before it's dark outside, it's not a good idea to ditch the regular bedtime schedule. Late bedtimes result in an altered circadian rhythm and a tired and perhaps cranky child. There are several poten potential health consequences of skimping on sleep during the summer, such as changes in mood, difficulty paying attention, overeating, and difficulty maintaining weight. Adequate restful sleep ensures that their digestive organs have time to rest and repair. Since 80% of the body's immune system dwells in the digestive tract, maintaining digestive health is crucial to the body's overall well-being. In turn, a healthy digestive system must be maintained in order for our body's hormones and circadian rhythm to maintain balance and deliver quality sleep. So how do we go about making our children get quality sleep? How much sleep are our kids supposed to even be getting? And what the heck does sleep have to do with your gut? Today we're going to be addressing all those things and we're going to be taking a different approach to our standard webinar series as we will be doing a live question and answer session with pediatrician Paula Krupstadt to learn how to manage the health of our kids as they return to school and how we can get them back to a healthy schedule and routine to best support sleep and digestion. So before we, get, we begin with Dr. Krupstadt, I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Krebstadt graduated from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio and completed her pediatric internship and residency, hang on, let me flip this. <laughs> there we go, wanted to see her pretty picture, um, and residency at William Beaumont Army Medical Center in El Paso. She served as a U.S. Army pediatrician at Fort Hood and then relocated to the Woodlands in 1995. She has since worked as a general pediatrician at Texas Children's Pediatrics and Texas Children's Urgent Care, and served as a pediatric hospitalist for Baylor College of Medicine at St. Luke's Hospital. Dr. Krufstadt is a certified practitioner of functional medicine by the Institute for Functional Medicine. And as of last year, she is one of only nine pediatricians in the world who are certified in IFMCP. So, Dr. Krebstadt, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to meet with me today, because I know it was tough. So, really, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're welcome. Um, yeah. So, before we get, in, uh, we get into the questions today, I was hoping you could tell everyone a little bit about your practice, the type of patients you typically see, um, kind of what you guys are all about over at your clinic. Okay. Well, the name of our practice is called Hope for Healing. And um, my training obviously is as a pediatrician, but when I ventured out into functional medicine, um, it's like taking a 40,000 foot view of a person, not just as a <laughs> disease. And so um, I treat adults too, but I require that they have their own pedi primary care provider. So pediatrics, routine stuff, but I incorporate functional medicine into all my well baby visits. So for like kids with eczema, we recommend um, cleaning up the gut and because uh, the skin is a reflection of the gut. And uh, I do a lot of genetic evaluations. Some of them are very affordable now and uh, treat a lot of autoimmunity. Um, one of my own children has uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So that's kind of a passion of mine, autoimmune illness. So. That's what we do, and we're open Monday through Friday. I only see patients, uh, well, I don't see patients on Friday afternoons usually, um, unless we have to work somebody in or something like that. But yeah, awesome. I'm in the Woodland, Woodlands, Texas, so. Awesome. Yeah, I've been out to your clinic. It's just, I really like it out there. It's a very nice clinic. Um, so again, you primarily, like you said, deal with pediatrics. What types of changes do you notice in the summer months compared to the months of the year when children are back in school? 
Well, everybody tends to get their days and nights flipped. Uh, a lot of kids are staying up really late, including mine, and then sleeping very late, <laughs> uh, especially the teenagers. And most kids um, do pretty well unless they catch a little summer bug. So, you know, vomiting, diarrhea, that kind of a thing. Because there are some things that float around in the summertime, but at least it's not like in school with strep and all those other things. So illnesses are less frequent in the summer than they are in the school month? Yeah, they are. Plus, you know, kids are not in closed quarters. Um, you know, when you're in the classroom around all these other children and exposed to all the germs of their family members, and uh, then when the weather gets a little bit worse and they're spending time and everybody's got the sniffles, uh, you do tend to see worse health when school starts. Got it. So that was my next question is, do you find that you see worse sleep patterns in the summer months? And does it reflect on the health of your patients? So, because I would think that if you're not, if they aren't getting enough sleep, their immune systems are going to suffer, their digestive behavior, all that's going to start to kind of spiral. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yes, uh, if sleep suffers, it does make kids more vulnerable to pick up little summer bugs. Uh, the fact that they're not in closed quarters. Um, it does lessen the overall sickness rate during the summer, but man, if you do get sick during the summer, like with a puking virus, that kind of thing, nausea, vomiting, um, and something that's actually pretty common in the spring is something called enterovirus. So um, sometimes we'll see even, you know, like a viral meningitis that shows up. So when you're sleep deprived, um, it does predispose you to all different kinds of stuff. But most kids get the chance to sleep uh, if their parents aren't having to take them to camps. But if, if parents have them in camps, then they're usually going to bed at the same time and getting up at the same time um, as best possible, uh, especially if the parents are working and they're taking their kids to child care in the camps. Yeah, I mean, and my, you know, another thing, too, when it comes to lack of sleep that a lot of us, you know, don't realize is weight gain. Um, and weight changes. Um, in the summertime, you know, t kids tend to be more lax on their diet. Um, they're not getting to sleep. And what? And I have to tell a lot of adults I work with, well, you know, if you're stressed, if you're not sleeping, your weight's not going to budge. So are there any weight variations at all in the summertime? Yeah, you know, you've got people going on vacations. You've got folks going to their grandmas. You've got people going to their relatives. And if the parents are able to keep the enemy out of the house. That's kind of like how we term it. It's like, don't have it in the house because otherwise it's too tempting and we're going to eat the garbage. So, you know, you do tend to see kids' weight climb when they're, if they're not super duper active, even if they're going to camps and they're doing activities, it's kind of set off if they end up going to relatives and they get all their comfort food like macaroni and cheese and ice cream and popsicles and push-ups and grandma and grandpa and the aunts and the uncles are like, here, you know, have this ice cream, you know. So, so yeah, you see uh, weight increases with poor sleep schedules, yes. Right, and I'm wondering if it's like with our adult population, how, you know, they say, um, and the average adult a year puts on around 10 pounds. Yep. Um, so for those that aren't, you know, being active, trying to, to be uh, conscientious about what they're doing. But with those kids that you're seeing gain the weight, are you are they losing it or is it staying? That's what I'm, I guess I'm kind of getting at, the, which yeah. could make a bigger risk is they're gaining it and they're not losing it throughout the school year. And then that's where we're starting to see declines in obesity and other things. Yeah, yeah the obesity epidemic and... You know, it's so true when you have poor sleep patterns and, uh, you know, the Johnny needs this sweet, you know, he's at grandma's, let's go have donuts. Oh, just this once, but that adds up. That's, that's very true. And uh, no, the majority of the kids are not losing it all and they're keeping it on and it's just a self-perpetuating problem. Got it. Um, so how much sleep should we be expecting our children to be getting each night? I mean, does it depend on their age? Um, you know, I have a six month old and I keep reading all these different things about how much sleep he's supposed to be getting and I'm freaking out. He's not napping enough and all that. Yeah. So it's 
far as you know the age differences do how does that vary and the teens actually need more sleep than our toddlers vice versa that kind of thing right um yeah that's a really good question too and some children um don't need quite as much as others but on the average um infants like between four and 12 months 12 to 16 hours a day so um you know you throw some naps in there but a lot of babies you put them down and they're not up for 10 more hours or 12. and if you've got a kiddo and you know learning to sleep is actually a skill um, and as a pediatrician and as a mom that breastfed three out of my four kids um, i am all for nurturing and loving and bonding with your children but one habit that is difficult even with little ones because those sleep problems tend to progress from infancy and if you can't get a kiddo sleeping through the night and train them to sleep in the night because actually that's what you need to do and I think most of the time it pulls on our heartstrings especially as yeah. breastfeeding moms you hear your baby cry yeah. and also if you work you're like oh my gosh I just you know you just it's so hard but um it's really good to work on training a kiddo to try to sleep through the night. So really, if a baby doesn't have um, a biochemical need for certain things, like for example, um, they were a preemie. So chronologically, if you say by X months of age, a kiddo should be sleeping through the night. And what does sleeping through the night really mean? So let's start with infancy and then move on up, because um, that's a great question. Um, Kiddos that are breastfed, that are born on time, but don't have any major medical problems should really be sleeping through the night eight to 10 hours by around four months of age. Around four months of age. A lot of times around six months, they start teething. And that's also between six and seven months, you, you can start adding in solids. It just is child dependent. So, um, it's kind of a catch-22. They start sleeping through the night, and then they start waking up. Well, is it their teeth, or is it their? Are they hungry? So you got to kind of tease that out as a parent, but you don't want them waking up all night long. Um, you want them basically going down when the sun goes down and waking up when the sun comes up, and that's really hard in uh, climates like Houston, Texas, where right now it's like going to be light until 8:30 or 9 at night, but. You just make those rooms nice and dark. But um, yeah, so that's about right. So infants anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day, and then a one to two year old, 11 to 14 hours a day, um, three to five, about 10 to 13 hours a day, and prepubescent kids like six to 12, about nine to 12 hours a day, and then 13 to 18, eight to 10 hours a day. So, you know, there's some fluctuation in there. My 11-year-old doesn't sleep as much as my 14-year-old does. Wow. So, yeah. So that's kind of about how many hours a day you need. And I know, because um, I've read all the books on, you know, because we were trying to figure out the best sleep training method. And I know one of the things that I didn't realize until I read it was you can't make up for lost sleep. No, you can't. And is that true of all ages, even as us now? Yeah. That's true. So when we do that damage to our body, we've kind of messed everything up. And, uh, you know, it just takes time to recover. But no, you can't make up for lost sleep. And, you know, one thing with children and adults, a sleep cycle, and I don't know if I'm in, impeding on questions you're going to ask later. Is it okay if I kind of go into REM cycle? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so a lot of times you probably notice with an infant, they'll be drool on the pillow sleep. They're just like, ugh, sleeping for about 45 minutes. Then they'll kind of fuss a little. They might even cry. They might open their eyes and wake up for about five minutes, and then they go back to sleep, and that's their REM sleep where you see the rapid eye movement, mm -hmm. and you see them sucking in their sleep. They're having dreams. They're going, uh, uh. ooh. It's mm -hmm. almost like, too, when you see a dog lying on the floor, the ground, and they're moving their their uh, leg and they're, they're like chasing somebody and they bark in their sleep. So it's about an hour and a half type sleep cycle, 45 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, is that right? Hour and a half? 
I think yeah. that's right. Yeah. So um, you kind of go in and out of this. In the REM sleep, you do a lot of restorative stuff there. And then there's such something that is so powerful that we've just learned about since 2015 is something called autophagy, auto and P-H-A-G-Y. Um, yeah. People are on the, oh, yeah. And they're, I'm sorry, but no, keep yeah. going. That's People great. are on like a, a keto kick because you can induce autophagy with the ketogenic diet. But when we sleep, that's our body's time to repair itself. And if you genetically have imp the impaired ability to clean the garbage and the cellular debris out of your cells, um, all this debris builds up. And in 2015, they were imaging the brain. And for the longest time, we didn't know what these things were called microglial cells. We thought they were the scaffolding for neurons, which they are, but they also have a huge number of receptors on them, and those receptors correlate with uh, many different things, inflammation in the body, the body's ability to dial down inflammation, um, inflammation that's turned on and not able to be turned off, and um, also the lymphatics. There are signs, uh, the, there's PET scans from 2015 and going forward where they've imaged these microglial cells and the brain's own lymphatic system. So we've got our lymph nodes in our neck and, you know, when you get a sore throat, swollen lymph nodes and all that kind of drains back to the liver, cleans it all out. Well, the same thing goes on in our brain. And during that restorative sleep at night, that's when autophagy takes place and Every cell, autophagy is a little different than detoxification. I think a good way to think about it is if all the people in your neighborhood took their garbage to the end of the street every day, but the trash man never came, well, what happens? The streets fill up with trash. The garbage man can't get through to pick up the trash, and uh, none of the residents can get out to go to their jobs. So... It's this really cool process that God put in all of us, and if it functions correctly, that's great. But if not, you get all this cellular debris, and you're supposed to be able to recycle all the good used parts and then kick out the garbage out of your cells. So that's a little different than detoxification, but autophagy is imperative to our health. And so that goes on in our brain and all the cells in our body, but during sleep, is when we clean out our brains. So if you don't do that, you're hosed. <laughs> so it's really important. Okay. And genetic testing is one way that we can determine if we're able to do that. Yeah. And uh, it's tied in with cancer, neurodegenerative illnesses, um, cognitive decline, um, and many autoimmune disorders. And simple things induce autophagy, short-term fasting, um, intermittent fasting, um, uh, infrared, far infrared sauna, sweating, yeah. um, and uh, you know natural agents like curcumin, green tea extract, resveratrol, bioperine, all those kind of things. Good, I do all those. So good. I'm, I'm yes. Good. Yeah, you're doing good. Uh, so, what are some of the typical signs that we should be looking for as parents that are signs that our children aren't getting enough sleep? Aside from you know crankiness. I mean, are there things like mood swings, tummy troubles that we should be looking out for that are kind of going to be a signal of, you know, before we start going to the doctor and doing all this different stuff, maybe we should think about how much sleep they're getting. Exactly. Yeah, you bet. Um, you know, um, constipation. Um, you know, if a kiddo's not getting good sleep, a lot of times it can manifest itself with constipation. Um, and also just irregular poops. Um, I use this little chart, it's called choose your poo. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, really you want your kids having like a sausage type poop or a banana or one that looks like corn on the cob. Those that's Bristol type three and four, that's normal. So if they're having these little pellets, not pooping every day or having lots of diarrhea, then you're not where you need to be. So. You know, when people say I have a gut feeling about it or I have butterflies in my stomach, you know, it's the brain talking to the gut, the gut talking to the brain. So if you're not getting good sleep, it really upsets the apple cart. Um, irritability, yes. Um, more congestion. 
Um, if you're not getting enough sleep, it makes you more vulnerable. Your immune system starts kind of tanking, so you're more susceptible to things in the environment. Um, environmental allergies, food sensitivities. Um, so they, they may just have tummy aches or they may not be super hungry because um, those sleep cycles are so critical for the gut to function appropriately. So I'm glad you brought up constipation. I'm gonna, that's one of my questions down here, but I'll go ahead and address it now. Um, I talk to so many people, parents and adults too, that think it's normal to only poop once a day or to not poop every, you know, to poop every few days, um, which is constipation and we're not detoxing that kind of thing. So what are you using to treat constipation other than making lifestyle change? What, you know, is it probiotics that you're going for or is there a specific product you use for constipation and kids, um, babies? Yeah. You, you know, one of my biggest go-tos is vitamin C. And uh -huh. um, I provide parents usually with constipation, I check things, you know, um, I routinely look at thyroid function and I don't just look at TSH or a free T4, but I look at antibodies because I guess the youngest I've, I've seen Hashimoto's thyroiditis where it's an autoimmune attack is uh, three years old. Um, so we had to talk about, you know, that we had to say no more grandparents given that kiddo comfort food, remove the gluten, remove the casein, that kind of a thing. But as far as things that I use, Miralax is polyethylene glycol. And when you get constipated, the gut, which is a lot like a floppy bag, it should be nice and tight. And then you should have peristalsis uh, every day. And you should usually poop two to three times a day, a nice soft little banana poop or like little snakes, not small caliber, but like about you know three quarters of an inch in the toilet. So you need to poop snakes. That means you've got enough fiber, um, not too much, not too little. Um, so dietary modifications, yes, more fiber, um, more water, because most people who are constipated are dehydrated. That's just chronic. I work at alkalinizing the diet, um, meaning you add things that are more on the alkaline side instead of acidic. And here I am drinking my coffee, which is not a good thing for acidity. Um, but yeah, we do a vitamin C flush, and um, that's a way to calibrate yeah, how much vitamin C you're missing, and that almost inevitably gets a kid cleaned out. But the problem is, is it takes about six weeks or so for the gut to go from this distended, you know, big stretched out trash bag back to the nice small gut that is moving and peristalsing all the time. So transit time from beginning to end meaning you eat something black or red, you should see it in your poo-poo within 24 hours. Um, that's a good healthy transit time for anyone. So vitamin C is my go-to. Um, but to keep uh, them regular, would you say definitely recommending like the enzymes, probiotics? I know, I know for me. Absolutely, yes. So, um, and almost all these kids too who come in and adults, yes, um, we get them on a good multi-strain probiotic um, and then, you know, I would say as far as the transformation products that I use, I use a ton of the kids digest powder, but digest zymes because usually they have a really sensitive gut and you can open that up too into water, suck it up in a syringe and squirt it yeah. in a kid's mouth. And I use that on little kids too, like infants yeah. all the time. Um, there's also a little chewable. Um, Purezyme also, I'll throw that in. You know, a lot of these kids come in with multiple complaints. Their body hurts. They're not detoxifying. So you need to clean all that crap out. So I'll do like the sensitive gut kit that's got the the digestime, the purezyme, and the plantidophilus. So yeah. Okay, cool. And that's what's good. That's what I love about the digestime too, is it actually is a it's a, with your pH balancing, it's actually gonna help with that. So that's like a a double thing. That's what I'm working on with my kiddo who I'm having constipation issues with. But yeah. I give him that digest time and he just, it, it gets it going. Um, but I use vitamin C too, so that I'm glad you said that. So okay. um, now what, uh, so again, we know the health consequences when we lose sleep. You know, we all, I think everyone on here pretty much has a general idea. Um, but can you talk a little bit on how lack of sleep affects our digestive system in regard to the rest and digest state mm -hmm. and 
more on how influential sleep actually is on the digestive system. Yeah, uh, that again too is a really great question. Okay, we have in most people that are in healthcare, health coaching have heard of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, but uh, the sympathetic nervous system is the one that kind of puts us in fight or flight, where we're just, we've, we were tuned in for emergencies and our lives, you know, we drive down the highway and we get somewhere and we're in fight or flight or we're late um, for something. Our, our blood flow is shunted from our, our digestive tract and it's not there and primed and ready to go to receive your food. So one of the really most important things to do when we, it's important to sit down for a meal um, to sit down and move from fight or flight to rest and digest the parasympathetic nervous system. So to sit down, it's really important not to have conflict at the dinner table. Um, and really getting ready for dinner starts when your kids walk in the door from school. When they come in the door, try to knock their chores out, try to have them pack their lunch for the next day. Um, start work on their homework and when school, when dinner time comes around you know dad rolls in the door he's tired mom might be rolling in the door sit down and just take a little bit of time to rest sometimes it's just teaching your kids how to deep breathe or just go okay i'm frazzled let's just take a good deep breath in and then blow it out you know for the count of seven you breathe in and then out usually about four times as long as your breathing in is, just to try to, and literally a five to seven times of that in and blow it out, feet on the floor, grounded, hands on the table or in your lap, um, that really helps calm you down, convert you from the fight or flight to rest and digest. Because awesome. if we just shovel our food down, we're not gonna digest it, partially digested food is gonna get entered um, into the colon, you know, it's just, and you're not going to chew as much. You need to chew your food to get the salivation going, those digestive enzymes. It's always good too. I always, people say, when do I take the enzymes? Well, usually for little ones, I say, you know, think about it as your second bite. Usually, you know, if you can do a chewable enzyme, you start and your second bite, you do your chewable enzyme, or just as you're beginning a meal or a substantial snack, just take it then. Right. To me, I'm, I'm like, just whenever you can get it in. Just, yes. You know, <laughs> it's a long process, so even if you miss it, it's ideal before, but yeah, as long as you get it in there. So okay, kind of shifting gears from sleep a little bit, we know when we're not sleeping, our digestive system is put under stress and vice versa. So for example, you know, we talk about gut issues and how they lead in leaky gut and how it's linked to insomnia but also anxiety. So can you talk to us a little bit about the gut's impact on neurotransmitter production and how that affects sleep patterns and what recommendations you give to properly support the nervous system as well as hormones such as melatonin that are important to sleep and relaxation in our kiddos? Right. Um, well, melatonin is really important. Um, it's secreted by the pineal gland and um, it helps you sleep. And I'm a big proponent of using it. Um, some people get wrapped around the axle on that, but I'm just like, you know, if you need it to sleep, just use it. Today's society is really, really stressful, and we, even as adults, we really need about eight hours to sleep. Um, as far as our stress in modern society, we've got these little things called adrenal glands, which all of us have probably heard about, but they're about the size of walnuts in adults, and they sit on the back of our kidneys in our upper back. and when we're stressed, um, our body makes something called cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. And we, when we're in uh, fight or flight, uh, sympathetic overdrive, we secrete tons of cortisol. And many times what hap it happens is that it leads to insomnia or difficulty sleeping. You're really tired, but yet your brain is wired. You can't turn it off. And so many people nowadays are jumping to using hormones but if you can put back into the body what it's missing as far as what the adrenal gland uses and as far as um, some of the micronutrients that um, the adrenal gland uses are um, um, magnesium is a big one. So magnesium is very calming and relaxing. So one thing with kids that I encourage parents to do is 
throw them in an Epsom salts bath a lot of times that night. So if they're upset about what's coming up, you know, a lot of kids are like, oh my gosh, it's the first day of school. I'm getting kind of scared about it, mommy. You know, put them in an Epsom salts bath, let them soak about 30 minutes. So you do about half a cup of Epsom salts, half a cup of baking soda. You can buy your industrial strength baking soda from HEB on the cooking aisle and just throw it in there, maybe a couple little drops of lavender. Um, and that just really helps the body relax. And if you do that 30, 45 minutes, and then you get them out of the tub, dry them off, get them into bed, you know, that really calms them and relaxes them. But um, we miss a lot of things called antioxidants because when we're we're, you, we're stressed out, we don't want to rust ourselves from the inside out because that's what oxidative stress is. You're driving down the highway in Texas, you see a pickup truck, it's got rust on the bumper. What's happening to that metal? It's being oxidized by the air. Well, the same thing happens in our cells if we don't have enough antioxidants, and most of us don't. So vitamin C, um, selenium, vitamin E, glutathione, um, those are just some of the antioxidants I can think of. Uh, many different um, yeah. chemicals and minerals function like that, but um, zinc, B vitamins, vitamin D is really imperative, vitamin E, something called carnitine, chromium folate, inositol, choline, copper. These are all things that tend to get depleted when we have a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress. Now, when you're stressed, your body, um, it's using all these amino acids. Well, first of all, you're not going to digest your food very, very well, so you may not have enough amino acids to make some of the neurotransmitters. And about 95% of our neurotransmitters are made in the gut, and there's a bunch that don't come out of the brain. Um, they're in the brain, but they don't tr cross the blood-brain barrier. But those amino acids that need to be broken down from the protein that we're ingesting and that's why you need to move from fight or flight to rest and digest to break your food down. Use your enzymes to break down the proteins. That's where protease is. Your protease, your purzyme, which is a protease gentle one, <laughs> is. And um, so that you can make more neurotransmitters. Um, okay. I kind of got lost in the weeds there. You want to draw me back in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> okay. it was more, you know, yeah, we were definitely talking. And that's, you went into micronutrients, which is what I was going to be asking was, as far as nutritional deficiencies, what ones are you seeing? Now, you mentioned with melatonin. I, I have a question on that. At what age is it okay to get that? Does it matter? Oh, gosh. You know, if, if first of all, if I see a kid who's having trouble sleeping, my question is, Why? And you have to look at them as the whole person. But um, usually they're a kiddo who's kind of high strung. They tend to focus on the same things over and over again. And so if I'm seeing that even in a little kid, I want to know what's going on in their home environment. I mean, as a pediatrician, everything runs through my mind. I think about abuse, sexual, physical, emotional, spiritual, any kind. Um, and especially with gut problems, too. Because right. when that's going on, it's manifested in the gut. We know that. And that's where, um, you know, you just got to investigate. But I've used melatonin in kids from about, oh, uh, <clears throat> I think for me about two is the youngest age that I've used it. Because if they're having trouble sleeping and they're not autistic or they don't have some neurological developmental challenge, I need to know why. Yeah. Um, so, but using a small amount, like one to three milligrams. Now for adults, melatonin at 20 milligrams, it might make you really sleepy the next day. It has anti-tumor effects. It's just very powerful. So people talk about, well, I take three a night. Is that bad? No, it's okay. Um, yeah. You know, so I won't go into all the biochemistry on that, but yeah. Um, but yeah. So I'd say about two is about the youngest. But, you know, I think that if you used it for a short period of time, if you were making a move from several different time zones over. If you wanted to use anywhere from one to three with a child that's you know 15 to 18 months, I think that would be okay for a short duration. But you wanna do all those things that help them promote melatonin, which is make sure their room is completely pitch black. And they shouldn't have any screen time about an hour before bed. You wanna remove blue light. And now we've got like our iPhones, and you can even buy 
blue light glasses and stuff that block those particular rays because it it turns the brain on. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so then the melatonin production falls, all that good stuff. You know, one other thing with sleep that's a big thing. Um, if you, you know, when when you eat close to bed, it's better to not eat really close to bed. Um, for an infant, that's one thing because they have, you know, that's different. But even with littler kids, it's really better not to give them a snack right before bed. They really, you know, the best is about three hours, but that's hard. Um, but that'll kind of get the gut churning. You don't want the gut churning when you go to bed. And then that's going to inhibit growth factor. Growth hormone is secreted when you go to sleep and you grow when you sleep. So you need that to grow and um, thrive. So you don't want your gut processing a bunch of stuff when your body's repairing itself and helping you grow while you sleep. So eating before bed will actually inhibit that hormone from being produced. Right, right. Oh. Yeah, it messes things up. That's uh, kind of how I say it to the parents. <laughs> You know, but yeah, so yeah, and if, if you look it up, you know, it's like one of those things, you, it's just best not to. Um, and so it's that, probably a really good habit to not get them in, into because even as they get older, that's one of the worst things you can do when trying to manage your weight is eat right before bed. Um, correct. Lot, you know, it's one thing if you're like a diabetic needing to regulate your blood sugar, but for most people, you know, I know that's hard for me not to snack before bed, but. I definitely, when I have a longer fasting period between dinner and breakfast, I do better. And um, so it's really a good habit to get kids into early. Yes. Um, so that's good to know. Um, <clears throat> so again, you know, when we're seeing problems with sleep, you obviously do, if you, you start with the gut, I'm guessing you kind of, you go there and then you, you do nutrient testing um, if things don't resolve. And then, you know, are there, are there any supplements that are not warranted in, in children? I know when you say pediatrics or when you talk about kids, like even with our products, I'll get questions all the time. Or is it, you know, oh, but it's a kid. I'm like, well, it's an enzyme. It's fine. It's not going to hurt it. But right. people get so scared of using supplements with kids. So right. anything we, you know, as far as the ones that are really good for sleep and anxiety, are there any that aren't warranted in, in kids that we should be aware of and maybe an alternative to those? Yeah, pharmaceuticals. I mean, don't use pharmaceuticals in kids if at all possible. Now, some kids with neurodegenerative things like pandas pens, um, that's um, where you get an autoimmune attack on the brain. Sometimes using hydroxyzine or Atarax, um, it's an H2 blocker. Um, it help, but um, but it's also kind of anti-anxiolytic. That's not a supplement; it's a prescription. But back to supplements, gosh, you know, um, at reasonable amounts, and you really do need to research that because Dr. Google isn't necessarily the answer on that. Right. And um, if you combine lots of different supplements, it's really best to go ahead and consult a physician or um, a health coach, a nutritionist. A, um, you're a registered dietitian and you have a master's. Mm -hmm. uh, it, well, yeah, so, you know, Consulting someone who can look those things up, and there's also something called a natural practitioner database. A person, a parent can go to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, and they can they can type in certain things and you can look it up. But um, also, you know, naturopaths are a wealth of information on some of the homeopathic remedies too that help with sleep. You want to avoid belladonna alkaloids. That is something that you do not want. And um, there was just a recall, and since it's public knowledge, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Highlands had to recall a lot of their stuff. They had some teething tablets and calming things, and you know, a lot of those babies were getting those little teething tablets, and then you look at their pupils, they're dilated, and it's because belladonna alkaloids affect the liver. The metabolism is not well known under six months of age, and even some in some of the teas. So like in fenugreek teas, mother's milk teas, you've got to be careful that they don't have belladonna alkaloids in there. So for sleep, that's something you need to avoid. And uh, I do not think that that's in a, um, your major um, homeopathic things. And like I said, the FDA recalled the Highland stuff. So, okay. yeah. But um, Comzyme is one of the products. And don't you guys have like a, a, I've, I had some here on my desk. I've taken it. We were all taking it to the office. 
Um, tr uh, Transzenish. Oh, transcendent. The regen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we were we were doing that too, and I'm like, okay, this is good. <laughs> yeah. The regen um, has the GABA, and it's more for the cortisol and the Calmzyme. I, I take it every night, um, and I'm going to talk about it at the end here. But it's a great. It uses more of an herbal approach, like with valerian and and those yeah. things. But even you know, there even when you get into herbs, that's another thing. They're like, well, it's not safe in kids. Well, not I mean, necessarily. Yeah, yeah, like Roman chamomile, valerian root, passion flower, um, melatonin. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the others. Those are those are fine in kids yeah. in, in reasonable amounts. Right. Yeah. Right. And again, in ours, because that enzyme delivery system, it's not high amounts of the herbs, um, which is kind of which makes it good. And I know all throughout my pregnancy and even breastfeeding, I did. I mean, my kid seems fine so far. <laughs> so it's fine. They're yeah. OK. Um, yeah. OK, good. So that's really good to know, because you do. You always wonder because I know dosing of like vitamin D, vitamin, all that changes mm -hmm. in pediatrics. Um, so, you have to measure a vitamin D level because there's actually a vitamin D receptor marker that if you have VDR TAC plus minus or plus plus, that means, you know, it's called heterozygous and homozygous. If you've got that, then you have an impaired ability to deliver vitamin D to your cells. And there's talk of changing the guidelines. Currently, when you draw a vitamin D, it says greater than 30 is normal. But from 80 to 100, that is tumor inhibited. I mean, it inhibits tumor growth. And there's a lot less rates of um, autoimmunity and inflammation, MS, colon cancer. So I aim for 60 to 80. And I just had somebody come back at 86. And I said, don't change your dose. Keep it right where it's at. Mine was 86. Yeah. So I'm like, OK, good. My 5,000 a day of D3K2 yeah. is working. So good. yeah. OK, cool. So. Um, now, going into um, what a lot of allopathic doctors prescribe, let's talk about Adderall for a second. Um, can you give us some alternatives that we can recommend to parents to use in place of CNS stimulants like Adderall um, that are going to have these unwanted side effects and health concerns? Yeah, you know, when you talk about ADD, um, really the major problem with that is that Dopamine's our neurotransmitter that helps us with short-term memory, focus, concentration, organizational skills, sleep stability, mood stability, hormone regulation. So sleep came in there. And um, dopamine is made um, predominantly the, by methylfolate, which is a form of vitamin B9, a bioavailable form. You get that from fruits and vegetables, but if you have genetic markers, um, for that, it's hard to get enough from vitamins or um, food. So um, most of the time, it's not a dopamine. I mean, it's a it's a it's a methylfolate deficiency and not dopamine. So what you want to do is you want to provide enough methylfolate um, that you'll make enough dopamine. So you want the gut to be functioning normally. And so some of the things that fuel dopamine, the methylfolate, of course, but all of your B vitamins, um, you want good antioxidants in the body so that you're not, you know, if, if you're pinging off the walls, you get stressed out, the teacher yells at you, that kind of a thing. But also, you know, teasing apart, what is normal? What's the normal temperament of the kid? Are they social? Are they a little boy? more boys get diagnosed with ADD than girls, and then the girls that don't get diagnosed that really have it because it's a true entity, um, many times go untreated and they just have kind of average grades and, and they squeak by, but all that time they have those issues. So um, as far as supplements go, you just want a good, um, well-rounded antioxidant supplement. You also want a good, well-rounded methylated B vitamin supplement. and in order to absorb that stuff, you also need good enzymes to get them right. in when you right. eat. Right. And start, you know, again, we always tell everybody diet first. Step one is diet. Then we get in, because we can supplement people all day. Um, if they're not right. breaking down the diet properly, we're just creating more inflammation. And then also if they're eating junk, well, what good are we really yeah. doing? So that's, that's good. So to keep us on, I know you have to get back in here in a minute. So I want to kind of talk about some of the slides you provided us with. Um, or some of the handouts. So you provided me with a handout that I'm, I have pulled up here. I hope everybody can see it. Is there yeah. a highlight here? It's on just healthy eating tips for children. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, this is from the Institute for Functional Medicine, and um, it's just fine for y'all to have this. I mean, I'm making it known that it's from IFM, and this is what I give out to a lot of my parents, too. But one of the things, you don't want to feed your kids dessert for breakfast. You don't want to give them refined carbs. What you want to give them is something that's going to stick and satiate, so fat, protein, and you want low and slow carbs. So um, protein rich, like hard boiled eggs with maybe um, nitrate, nitrite free sausage, and maybe a side of fruit. Scrambled eggs with beans and sauteed veggies. Unsweetened almond butter on toast with a banana. And I do tend to avoid bananas and high glycemic foods because it really makes the insulin go up after the blood sugar goes up. And then you get this, you're craving it. Wow. So to stabilize that blood sugar, you want more. Um, low and slow carbs and fat um, okay. and protein. So, um, you know, maybe even leftover stuff from dinner or a good fruit and veggie smoothie with a protein powder. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then, you know, if kids don't like fruits and vegetables, get creative, you know, um, that's the little slide here. Let them get involved with making their food, okay? Get a little cook and if they don't like to eat, Get in there. I don't like to cook. Like my 14-year-old, she's like, "Mom, would you please?" And I'm like, "Come here. You're gonna do this with me." Um, you know. But my 11-year-old's a chef. I mean, she's in there. She made gluten-free spaghetti. You know, brown rice noodles. Although brown rice has a lot of arsenic in it, but you know, you got to give wherever. You know, and um, with sauce and um, fresh okra. You know, that wasn't slimy. I'm like, this is awesome. My kid yeah. is making yeah. me dinner. Most of them are just playing on their phones. So that's really yeah, cool. yeah. So um, get them making smoothies um, and fresh juices, things like that. And a lot of times with the juices, you want to avoid juices because you would not go out and eat eight apples. You don't want to separate the fiber from the fruit. So if you're going to do juice, we're talking teeny amounts. And it's also a great way to hide supplements if you need yeah. to do that too. Um, you got to get creative. Let your kids play with your food. You know, make things fancy and fun, like maybe put notches in the cucumbers, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, julienne type things. Um, rotate the foods uh, to prevent uh, nutritional deficiencies um, and also food sensitivities. If you rotate your foods, then the gut's not being exposed to the same thing over and over again. And that way you can just eat the rainbow, eat everything. Um, let me see, anything else? Yeah, just avoid anything that's processed or in a box. If it, the whiter the bread, the quicker you're dead. Okay, right. that's a good thing to remember. Anything white is gross. Okay, right. so that's got some really good stuff on it. So yeah, and if, someone, um, if you, these handouts that I'm gonna be showing, if you would like for me to send these to you, please shoot me an email. Um, at a r a w l s at t e c enzymes dot com. That's my personal email, and I'll be glad to send those to you. So let's move on to our next one. Um, this talks about you know environmental triggers to avoid. I know a lot of these are common knowledge, but are there any specific that we need to that you're seeing a lot of in your practice that we need to make sure parents are aware of? Yeah, you know, um, as far as like food goes, you know, some well. Our, we just live in a toxic environment. People are like, well, why are there so many more autoimmune diseases? I really think it's due to toxicity. Glyphosate, which is Roundup, by the way, they just won a $289 million settlement against glyphosate, uh, Monsanto. Mm -hmm. They have been suppressing evidence for years and years, but it's basically everywhere. It's in cord blood. It's in the water. If you have an organic garden. It, it's, you know, it's we're, 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 we're away from it. Yeah, we can't. So eating lots of cruciferous vegetables will pull some of that garbage out of your gut um, and your body. But um, chlorine, chlorine is what we call, um, well, it binds in and it disrupts hormone production. So if you can put water filters on your, um, uh, you know, something on your um, shower heads, um, faucets, um, if you could get like a reverse osmosis system for your house, and that adds minerals back in because when you do RO water, you extract the minerals. And that's where, um, isn't it, is it the Excelzyme that has a bunch of minerals in it or not? That's a yeah, antioxidant. That's our mineral complex is the, yeah, mineral, uh, mineral. the mineral complex. Yeah. yeah. So it's got a lot of the trace minerals and stuff that gets sucked out. Um, but um, yeah, 
Use stainless steel cookware or cast iron. That's all we've got. We got rid of all of our other junk because you don't want all that garbage flaking off into your food. Um, trans fats, um, you want to buy organic produce and you want to buy meats um, and poultry that are hormone free, non GMO, um, you know, preferably grass fed, organic, that kind of a thing. So you're not disrupting the hormone production in your body. Um, yeah, anything that is processed, refined sugar, sugar is the enemy. Sugar is the enemy. It is so bad. And actually, there's a gene that if you have it, you're much more prone to be hyperactive with sugar. So that's not an old wives' tale. Um, you know, people see that in their kids. Um, and things that, you know, your kid may be sensitive to, um, um, caffeine, monosodium glutamate, artificial sweeteners, food dyes, nitrites, sulfites, glutamate, propionates, things like that. So that's all in the handout and it'll kind of define it. So in the last one, so you, you have this great handout on tips for better sleep. So hopefully people can get some use out of this. Anything here you'd like to kind of, before we get um, to the, you have a couple. Yeah, I'll just kind of go. You really need to start the prep beforehand. You know, when they roll in the door, get all the conflict and the arguments over before you get to dinner. Don't have arguments at the dinner table. Wind down, pull the technology down. If your kid wakes up in the middle of the night, don't use, don't let them play on a device. Don't let them turn on a TV, an iPad, or a phone. And you shouldn't keep any of those things in your children's room. Um, you know, just get the phone out of the room. And they shouldn't have it right next to their head. That's horrible. We do yeah. know that electromagnetic fields are really bad. They're toxic. They throw you off. Um, I have a little patient who's a leukemia survivor, and they found out in their house that their wiring was right by the head of her bed. And, um, you know, she'd been exposed to all those EMF fields all that time. Um, Okay, so bedtime routine, start the wind down, lay out the clothes for the next day, get all the homework in the backpack, have the lunch made so there's no rush rest in the morning. Everybody's stressed. You don't want that. You don't want them stressed out before they go to bed either. So, you know, those high protein, high fat snacks when they come in the door from school, do that too, like with a, you know, low glycemic index berries, fruit, and then um, back to sleep. I'm all over the place, a little ADD here trying to wrap it up. Um, lights, you want your room cool. Um, and a cooler head is better than a warmer head. Yeah. So a cool head, sometimes uh, cover their eyes, make sure there's not a ton of light showing. Some kids do well with white noise, but if you do that, have it about six to eight feet away from their head. Like I put my phone white noise and I put it under my bed at the foot of the bed and I have to grab this cable and pull it when the alarm goes off. Um, oh, wow. so it's, yeah, so it's like like six feet away from me. Um, and if they have a real alarm clock, that's better than one that has um, blue light. And if it's blue light, turn it around. So yeah. start the routine, wind down and have a little, have a little routine, read them a book, you know, get them in their PJs, rock them, pray with them, talk about the day, maybe even lay down a little bit, give them a security blanket. You know, there's little things that kind of comfort them. It's okay to have a teddy bear or a blanket or whatever. But no nightlight? No nightlight. Uh, avoid the nightlight. Avoid okay. the nightlight. So last thing before you go, we did have one question. Um, there's a, a, a listener on here today. There, uh, what about putting the probiotics down this, her son's feeding tube? Yes. I would do that um, and just give it a good swish. And here's the thing, you don't want to use anything down the feeding tube. This may seem obvious, but you don't want to use tap water because it has chlorine. Chlorine kills antibiotics, I mean probiotics, good bugs in our gut. It's like drinking pool water. So you don't want to do that. So yeah, you can um, dilute the probiotic and um, suck it up in a syringe, aspirate it, and just shoot it down. Um, the transformation enzymes, like the probiotic 42.5 and also the probiotic, which I think is 30 billion colony forming units, either one of those, you can open them up, suck it in, and squirt it down. That's and you good. you do the same thing with it. I know the enzymes can be done uh, too as well. So if you're... Yeah. yeah. Well, Dr. Krebset, I know you got to get to your patients today. Thank you so much for spending time with us. You were awesome. So much great info. Um, and again... Uh, 
thanks a lot. So have a great rest of your day. If everybody else will hang tight, I have a couple of things I want to kind of go over. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's good. She's going to sign okay. off. Okay. So she had mentioned um, a couple of products that we have. I just wanted to highlight the two that we have on special this month. Our Comzyme is an excellent formula that can be used in adults and children, as we discussed. And it is a blend of herbs that are well known for their calming properties. Um, as with all of our formulas, it contains an enzyme delivery system to ensure that the nutritional components of herbs are making it to the actual cell. Um, this formula is perfect for anyone struggling with insomnia, anxiety, ADD, hyperactivity, just overall stressful lifestyle. Um, the next product is one you don't probably hear as much about from us, which is our Excelzyme, which is really an underrated product. Um, it was designed for those needing a natural alternative to deal with low energy, brain fog, and mental clarity, as well as lack of focus. Um, it uses a combination of energizing herbs such as coca-cola, ginseng, and ginkgo, and also gives you a boost of antioxidants as she was talking about the importance of those with some things like alpha alpha and rose hips as well as grape seed. Um, and again, the benefit to using any transformation product is that there is that enzyme delivery system to ensure that the body is able to utilize what we are providing in the capsule. So, and just a reminder, uh, we do have those two products on special this month. Uh, if you purchase a case of Excelzyme or Comzyme, you will get four bottles free of your choice of those. Um, and then if you would like to learn more um, about us, if you're newer to these webinars or you're not using our stuff, you can view our catalog by visiting catalog.transformationenzymecorp.com. Um, if you're needing to place orders or interested in placing an order, you can reach us at orders at tecenzymes.com or give us a call at 1-800-777-1474. Um, be sure to be on the lookout for handouts. Every month we send out a clinician's toolbox, which provides you with different handouts. We're featuring protocols. Transformation has over 100 different clinically based protocols for different disease, diseases and conditions. So we always send those out. Um, a few of those we'll be sending out in our clinician's toolbox, as well as things like science briefs, um, product rationale, that kind of thing. Um, and lastly, be sure to sign up for our next webinar that we'll be having on September 19th. Um, it is going to be on mindfulness, and our speaker is going to be Mira Desi, the ingredient guru. Um, the purpose of her webinar is going to be to help you gain better understanding of stress and how, to, how it impacts our clients um, and to understand the benefits of mindfulness and strategies to incorporate mindfulness into your practice. Because I think that's something that a lot of us, I know me for one, I, I hit all I hit all the, the dots, but I, I always forget about how important your state of mind is in the healing process. So she's going to talk a lot about that. So it should be a good one. As always, thank you guys for spending your lunch hour with us today. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Have a good one.